Please pass your cards inside aisle to be picked up at this time. And good morning. <clears throat> I remember back in 1972, I am searching the scriptures, trying to find out what is what, and uh, try to understand what's being said by the Holy Spirit, you know, giving us the inspired word of God, and, and trying to understand it was a, uh, not an easy task at all, and I needed direction. And one of the difficult things I had in studying the Word of God was this, this idea of one, that uh, God wants us to be one. I, I couldn't, it took me a little while to get that into my mind. What do you mean God wants us to be one? And uh, it didn't make any sense to me then until I finally understood, well, Jack, you didn't write this. This is God's plan, not your plan. And just look at the Word of God and quit trying to interpret what the Word says and let the Word of God tell you what the Word of God says. Now, what I just said is a, a, a very difficult thing for some to grasp. It was for me. But as I started studying it, I found out in looking at the Word of God that there was a problem in the first century with the idea of division. Now, God says, and let's just go ahead and read this, in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, Paul says, I appeal to you, I'll get to that word in a second, I appeal to you brothers. Now he's talking to members of the Lord's body. There is specificity here. He is talking because there is a problem that existed. When you read the word of God, it's just not something that's written down to, to make a, a larger book. There's a reason why things are written. And there was a struggle here. A struggle with the idea of oneness. In other words, this is talking, I believe, about being uh, together with the Word of God. There was a struggle about some wanting to do this, some wanting to do that, some wanting to go this direction, some wanting to go that direction. Even a struggle with probably things about salvation. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I'll come back to that, that, you, that all of you agree. Now, I know here we are in this congregation not all of us agree on everything. Now, uh, I'm talking about our taste of food. I personally like sushi. My wife says, why? I like mustard greens and collard greens and turnip greens. Some of you will look at me and say, why? I don't like mayonnaise, Miracle Whip, sour cream. Some of you will look at me and say, you're just silly. <laughs> but we have dislikes. But we're not talking about those things. We're talking about oneness in the Word of God. Now, notice what he says. By the, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you. Concerning what? Well, but that you, you, that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. I didn't invent that. I didn't write that. This isn't my plan. Would it not be easier for all of us with our mentality to say, what if God accepted everything as long as we loved Him? And as long as we had this love in our heart, and God knows how we, how we are in our heart and how much we, we love Him, and why isn't that enough for God? And yet we come to Scripture, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, notice this, that I want you to agree, I want there to be no divisions among you, I want you to be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Concerning what? Well, it's concerning the will and purpose of God. The church here had only been established some 20 some odd years, and now all of a sudden, there's a problem that would arise, because when you have people together, people can create problems. Hello? And so here we go. Watch this. The idea of appeal means to beseech, to beg, or to plea. He says, I am begging you that this gets done. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, here is a problem. Don't tell me it's not a problem because the Word of God says it is. Paul could have bluntly commanded them to rid themselves of all division. Some people come to this and say, well, Paul, here he appeals to them or beseeches them. 
But Paul just, he wasn't very stern about it. You know why? Directed by the Holy Spirit, didn't Paul say, I command you to do this? You're going to burst hell wide open? I mean, I'm telling you right now, you're going to lose your very soul. Why didn't Paul tell them that? Well, listen, in the idea of understanding Scripture, blunt or not, it is still a direct command to stop not agreeing, to stop being divisive. It was a direct command to be united, a direct command to have the same mind, and a direct command to have the same judgment. Some people, you know, they, they look for any, any out they can have. Of course, this is talking about matters of faith and morals. When it comes to the idea of, of what it takes to be saved, somewhere along the way, one became two. Somewhere along the way, I know from the first century, and I'll just use baptism here, but somewhere in the, in the first century, we know that the first gospel sermon said, we need to be baptized for the remission of our sins. Now, I'm not just making that up. That's what Scripture says. I know from Scripture, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, baptism doth also now what? Save us. I know that from Scripture. I can read it, book, chapter, and verse. Somewhere... It had to begin, did it not? Because we have those that don't believe baptism is necessary for salvation. I know from reading Scripture, Titus 1, 1 Timothy chapter 3, I know that Scripture tells us about elders and how Titus 1 and verse 5, to appoint elders in every city. I know from reading Scripture, those 22 depending uh, or more qualifications that elders are supposed to have, I know from reading Scripture those are there. Somewhere along the way, church, someone has gotten the idea they don't even have elders. Something changed. I know from reading Scripture, in Colossians 3, from uh, Ephesians chapter 5, Colossians 3, 16, Ephesians 5, 19 and following, from Hebrews 13, 15, and other passages that I, I know and I understand very well about instrumental music and how that uh, in, the, in the first century, you go back and read history and all of this, that you find out it was a cappella. They were even challenged if this reciprocal reflexive pronoun, Ephesians 5, verse 19. This is what you do one to another. You are to, to encourage, to edify. You're to teach through the Word of God, and there weren't any instruments of music listed at that at all. I know Scripture teaches that. Somewhere along the way, it changed. One became two. Two became three. And the Word of God still says, that we'll see, still tells us that God doesn't like division. This appeal emanated from the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how the appeal was made. I am appealing to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, that is by the authority of Christ. Matthew 28 and verse 18, Jesus said, all exousia, that means liberty of action. You know, all freedom, you know, all authority has been given to me. You know, so uh, we understand that. Acts 4 and verse 12, no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Uh, this is the, I found it interesting. The first 10 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, this is the 10th time in 10 verses Paul mentions Christ. He's being serious here. Church that meets at Corinth. The church of God that meets at Corinth. I'm telling you in the first 10 verses of 1 Corinthians, 10 times I mentioned to you about Jesus Christ. I'm not appealing to you by some human standard. I'm not talking to you about some mere human man. I'm talking about he who Hebrews 4 and verse 15 says was without sin. He who would, John 10 and verse 18, came to this earth and freely gave his life for us. He who, Ephesians 1 and verse 7, redeemed us from our sin problem by his blood. Jesus Christ, Hebrews 9 and verse 22, without the shedding of that blood, there's no remission of sins. I'm talking about the power of Christ Jesus, is what Paul is saying. Ten times he mentions our Lord and Savior. In Colossians 3 and verse 17, Paul said this, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. He says, this is the oneness I want you to have. Whatever you do, 
in word or in deed. You make sure it's done by the authority of Christ Jesus. You make sure you're not going off on some tangent. You make sure that one never becomes two, that two never becomes three, and three never becomes 7,000 that we have now. You just, this is a, a very, very important topic that we're discussing today. Before there can be unity, there must be absolute adherence to the same standard by all. Hello? Isn't that true? Before there can be unity, there must be adherence to the same standard by all. I wonder why football has rules. You ever wondered that? Number one, I don't know why somebody would want to get, well, I guess $10, $15 million a year might lure you into doing that. But I've watched these guys and I wonder why anybody would want to make a living out of somebody handing you a ball and then you have all these big old muscle bound guys chasing you, trying to knock you down. And then you get up and you do it all over again. But I wonder why it has rules. Wonder why baseball has rules. Wonder why volleyball has rules. One of the sports I really don't like, boy, I'm going to get flack for this, golf. You know, whomping a ball and then going out and chasing it to whomp it again, boy. And I understand, I guess one of the reasons I don't like it is because it takes so much talent to do it. And whenever I'd hit the golf ball, I got so tired of being over there where the ticks and chiggers were. So that's where the ball would go. But I wonder why they have rules. The same standard, the same rules. I wonder why that is, even in a game. Many seem not to be able to understand the need for an absolute standard in spiritual matters, such as a standard about obedience, standard about the church, standard about Christian living, Standard about morality, standard about husbands and wives, standard about raising children, standard about our giving back to God, standard about worshiping in spirit and truth, standard about the steps of, of salvation, all these different things, there has to be a standard. Imagine the confusion that would exist if we didn't have absolute standards and weights and measurements and financial matters in the economic realm. Can you imagine taking 10 ounces of gold to sell it at the bank? And they paid you for one ounce. No one in here would be upset, right? No, Brother Smith, when it comes to gold, I understand a strict measurement. And I, I just admonish the bank, and I'm telling you right now, I'll be crowing like a rooster right in the front lawn of that bank until they pay me that 10 ounces I deserve. I understand that. It comes to the Word of God. Why don't we understand the idea that there's an exact measurement to be used? Matter of fact, you hear, whenever you uh, study Scripture, you hear something known as, as the canon. That we have the Old Testament canon and the New Testament canon. Or you'll read in history about the canonical writings. And you may wonder what's that, what that's alluding to. Do you know the word canon comes from a word that means measuring rod? That's what it means. We have Scripture, it's the measuring rod. It is already defined, it's interpreted, it's already right there for us. It's not of any private interpretation. And the Bible says, just be one. That one standard for Christians, of course, is the Word of God. Watch this, John 16, 13 and 14. This is Jesus promising to the apostles. He says, when the Spirit of truth comes, now notice, he will guide you into all the truth. Now by all the truth there, he's obviously talking about morality and talking about spiritual matters and spiritual concerns. And he goes on to say, He will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come, he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The question is, has the Holy Spirit come? Amen and amen. Acts chapter 2, on the Jews. Acts chapter 10, on the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit has come. That Holy Spirit that's to be, uh, to, to be a, a, a deposit for us, Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14, a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. The Holy Spirit that is to lead us, Romans 8 and verse 14, through the Word of God. 
the Holy Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5, we're not to, to quench the Holy Spirit's fire. Ephesians chapter 4, 30 and following, we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit. It is that Holy Spirit that has come. The Holy Spirit that tells us, Ephesians 4, 4 through verse 6, seven different ones it gives us. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, you know the list. And it just goes on and on and on. So we understand about the idea of one. Some say being perfectly joined together in the same mind and judgment is impossible. Then why is it required by the Holy Spirit? I'll read that in a second. I told you before, I'll never forget, I, I wasn't a, I worked for Coleman Dairy. And Vicky and I got married, I worked for Coleman Dairy. And uh, shortly thereafter, we got married. Uh, so I was a milkman and delivered to uh, Russellville area, Arkansas Tech and all that. And, and boy, I tell you what, talk about a job I never want to do again, that's it. But uh, where was I? Oh, yes. And I remember stopping at one place, and a guy, uh, I talked religion where I'd go. You know, I was a new convert on fire for, for the Lord, and I just wanted everybody to, to know that. And uh, I remember one guy telling me, he said, uh, he said you're Church of Christ, aren't you? Said, yes, sir, I am. He said, I, I just don't get it with you people. Well, I'd never been attacked for being a Christian before, but this is the first time. So I thought to myself, here we go. So I'm loaded for bear. I'll answer whatever you want answered. You know, fire away. I've been a Christian for two months. I know everything. So he said, um, he said, you people think that everybody's supposed to think alike and be alike. Well, yes, sir. That's, I, think, I think that we should. You know, in, in matters about salvation and morals, I think we ought to be on the same page. Absolutely. Concerning salvation, I think we ought to be on the same page with what they were doing in the first century. If they were Christians in the first century and they followed a certain pattern or process and became Christians, why can't we do the same thing and be Christians today? No one's changed it. You can't show me where someone changed the Word of God. You may try. And he looked at me and he said, well, let me ask you a question. You've heard this before. He said, if we're all supposed to think alike, I just don't believe that because if everybody thought alike, everybody would love my wife. I looked at him and I said, I've seen your wife. That's not going to happen. No, I didn't say that. No, no. no I, didn't. I did not go there. I've never seen his wife. But, you know, it's, a, it's a ridiculous, you know, it's a ridiculous argument. Number one, we're talking about matters of spirituality here. And we're talking about us as the wife of being the church, Christ being the husband, making sure we get this right. And we, we have to understand that. Even though the Bible does not come out and use these words together, the principle is certainly there. It's there in Jeremiah. Read Jeremiah 1 and Jeremiah 2. Read the book of Hosea. Read other books where it talks about the idea and the principle of spiritual adultery. Now we know what adultery is in the physical realm, do we not? It's when one partner in the marriage cheats on the other partner in the marriage and commits adultery. We understand that. And the principle is true concerning Scripture where he talks about, you know, my people have played, uh, uh, played the, the harlot or the prostitute and gone after other gods. The definition there, the understanding is from the Old Testament until now. The definition was the, uh, uh, the, the idea of that is spiritual adultery. And you see, we talked about in class where God many, many times he said, now, I don't want this, for lack of a better term, I don't want intermarriage taking place. I don't want it to happen, but listen carefully. He never said because of the nationality. He never said because of the color of skin. That's not what the problem was. The problem was because when they intermarried, God said, here's the warning, and it was always attached to that because they're going to lead you away from God. And under the, the old law, we understand, they had something known as a proselyte. Why did they have a proselyte? Was it, a proselyte was whenever a Gentile wanted to convert to Judaism, the person would be proselytized, would be, be converted and be, have to be ceremonially cleansed in order to be a Jew, have to undergo circumcision for the males. Now Why? Because under God's law, under the old law, God wanted there to be one person, one man, one religion. 
Now we come along and, and we get all shocked under the New Testament when God says there, you know, that he broke down that middle wall of partition to create for himself one, look, Ephesians 1, one new man. About 7,000. So we look at this and you know, some people, it's hard to understand, but watch this. Philippians 1, 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and, uh, come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm, watch, in one spirit, that's one attitude, by the way, with one mind, watch this, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. He said, when I come, I want to make sure there, there aren't any divisions among you that someone's talking about this and someone's talking about that and someone's doing this and someone's doing that. Just be on the same plane is what he is saying here. And you know, none of us can, can you know, we can't battle that. We can't say, well, well no, that's not true. Uh, watch this. If it'll change, you will change. There you go. Now watch. If all loved God supremely, and loved each other as we love ourselves, there would be no cause for division. Well, let me say that again. If we all love God supremely, and everybody just opened up the Word of God and got into the Word of God and, and uh, you know, let the Word of God get into them, and loved each other as ourselves, there would be no cause for division. I think there's a way we could see. The solution to every problem would be at hand. This is not my thought, somebody else's. Proverbs 13 and 10, by insolence, that's the idea of pride, comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice is wisdom. I have actually, in the last 36 years, sat down with several people and talked to them about the Word of God and show them book, chapter, and verse. That's what I want to do in a Bible study. Well, Brother Jack, what do you think about this? What do you think about It's not about what I think. Let me open up the Word of God. I want you to read it. And to me, it has a, a more impact. When people open up the Word, and they open up to passages like 1 Peter 3.21, and they see where it says, Baptism is also now save us. And they haven't been taught that, haven't heard that, haven't read that. When you look at Mark 16, you know, 15 and 16, especially verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, he that believeth not shall be condemned. And they've never read that, never heard that. You know, it's just, it's just an amazing thing. You turn over there and you read about all these different things and, and you know, people are shocked. Uh, just, and whenever you, you let the force of that and let people read it for themselves and suddenly now it makes a difference in their lives. Suddenly now uh, things are about to be changed. I'm running out of time. Philippians 3.16. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. I'm going to go quickly over the next couple things here. To be of one mind is possible only if we acknowledge and follow the New Testament in today's world. What if all decided to scripturally and spiritually follow Paul's advice in Romans 14? Watch this. Who, uh, Romans 14, 18 and 19. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Paul also said in 1 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. In other words, what he is saying is, let's do away with human opinion and get back into the word of God. Then we go on to this. Paul tells the church at Rome, to be like-minded toward one another. Here's what he said, Romans 15, 5 and 6. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony, watch, with one another. Now watch. In accord with Christ Jesus, and together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Over and over again in Scripture, this idea of oneness, I don't have time this morning. Sometime in the future, I want to uh, preach a sermon about the, the oneness of togetherness and, and how the Bible talks about being together and this oneness. And you're going to be shocked how many times that's mentioned in Scripture. It's just something. The difference between being of the same mind and being of the same judgment may be the difference between matters of faith and matters of opinion. 
There's an old adage in the restoration movement that holds true today. In all matters of faith, we will be united. In all matters of opinion, we will allow liberty. But in all things, we will show genuine love. I just, you know, just this. I just, every time I study this and look at this, I'm taken aback by the idea of how one would become two and how it'd catch on. And then now it seems to be so many different. One of these days I want to talk to you about different religions and, and what they believe. I'm talking about the absurd things that you, uh, you have now, all the way from a, a religion that is uh, accepted by the government as being a religion and how that in the foyer there used to be, I don't know if there still is, but they would have a, a dead baby that was floating in formaldehyde. Um, of course, it was satanic, to say the least, but it was known as a religion nonetheless. And, you know, how far people will go to have their way religiously. In Romans 16, 17, and 18, and we're going to close here in just a second. Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions. Now watch that. He said, I don't want it to happen. Why is this warning there? And create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught, avoid them. Now notice what's being said. Through the Holy Spirit again, he's warning the church and the church at Rome. He said, I want want to warn you about members of the church that cause division that are contrary to doctrine. Now notice, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Now, that concludes today's lesson, but you know, suffice it to say, it is a very, very serious thing to not get the Word of God correctly, not, not have it done correctly. Now, I know people will attack and say, now wait a minute, how do you know that you're right? And you're back to square one again. It's getting back to the Word of God and having that same standard. If we can get back to that, you know, the, the same idea and the same principle, and simply say, you know, this is, this is what the Word of God has to say. Other people say, well, well now wait a minute, that's what you say and, and that's what we say. What I'm talking about is having a a discourse, being able, not being afraid to sit down with the truth of the Word of God. The truth has nothing to fear. I found that out a long time ago. If I have book, chapter, and verse I can turn to, you're not arguing with Jack Smith. You're arguing with the Word of the Lord. And therein lies the difference. So God says, I don't want there to be any divisions. I want you to speak the same thing, be of the same mind, be of the same judgment. Man says it's all right to be different. I've even, uh, in a debate one time, asked a gentleman. I said, now wait a minute. You're telling me that you think that you're right and you're correct with the first century. He says, I absolutely do. I think I'm right. You know, and the, they had a, a different idea about salvation than we do, and a different idea of salvation, a person with whom I was debating, than uh, a bunch of other people have. He thinks he's absolutely right and yet turned around and accepted all the other people, including us, as being right also. So he stood up and preached about the doctrine of one and about being right, and I believe I'm right, and then turned right around and said, but I accept everybody else that doesn't agree with me. So there's a problem here somewhere. Somebody has to be wrong, right? If you have one person preaching, baptism is absolutely necessary and another person preaching, no, it's not. Either both are wrong or one is right, but both can't be right. Amen? So uh, we're smart enough to figure that out. Maybe someone here today that's never said yes to Jesus. We love you. We want everybody to hear the gospel message. We want everybody to take part in the plan of salvation. The Word of God tells us you're to hear the word of God, Romans 10, 17. After you've heard, you're to believe that Jesus Christ is he, John 8 and verse 24. Once you believe that, you're to repent of your sins, Luke 13 and verse 3. You're to confess with your mouth, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Unto salvation, confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
And then you'll be buried with him in baptism, be raised to walk in newness of life. But that doesn't end it. That doesn't end it. 1 John 2 and verse 6 says, If we abide in him, we ought to walk as he walked. 1 Peter 2.21 says, Christ left us an example that we should follow his steps. So after baptism comes the real challenge, and that's living for Christ. If you have a need today, won't you come as we stand and sing?